Hello, White Sox fans, and welcome to another edition of the Future Sox podcast. My name is Ian Eskridge. Joining me this afternoon is James Fox, as normal. And we are also very excited to have the play-by-play voice of the Winston-Salem Dash with us, Andrew Murphy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited for uh, I'm excited for the season to get rolling along here soon. Um, yeah, we're recording this on a Wednesday, and opening day in Asheville is is Friday. So um, things are things are coming together, and I'm I'm in the process of uh, you know getting my ducks in a row and uh, taking care of things here in Winston. But um, just ready to get going. And th- thanks so much for having me on. I, I know this has been kind of a kind of a long time coming here. We've been talking about this for a few years now. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, so I know that uh, James is excited about it. I'm excited about it. Noah Schultz starting the year with uh, Winston-Salem. Um, let's go ahead and start the the whole thing off talking about uh, basically everybody's number two prospect with the White Sox, Noah Schultz. Um, have you uh, talked to him yet? Uh, have you seen him around? I've said like 10 words to the guy. <laughs> he's been he's been very busy um pulled him for media day yesterday and he got some good face time with the local media um but no i haven't really had a chance to to sit down and and have a you know a lengthier conversation with noah or a lot of these guys um for that matter just because it's so hit the ground running but um what i can tell from the the few interactions i've had is that he's just he's just a, a nice guy and he's um ready to go he's ready to compete and you know i've been reading things about um, what he's been doing in the off season to uh, to prepare for this year, which is, I mean, it's going to be his first full season in affiliated baseball. Kind of a, I don't want to say prove it year because he's he's proved a lot already. But again, it, it's gonna it's gonna be um, a more accurate indication of of how he might pan out long term with more innings under his belt. Um, but really, I mean, the first thing that sticks out about the guy is that he's he's six foot nine, a towering presence on the mound, gives him that nice natural downward plane with his with his fastball and his secondary stuff, and um, just a just a fearsome, fearsome left hander. Um, no surprise that he's high on everybody's list. Yeah, I mean, we're hearing uh, from uh, Arizona that he's hitting you know high nineties on his fastball, and that the slider is just looking absolutely ridiculous. Um, you have anything, James, that uh, you want to address? So, so I had got some intel today and kind of reported like how the White Sox are expected to treat Schultz, where it's going to be more of kind of like a college starter, where he's starting Saturday apparently, and he's going to start every Saturday, so he's not in the typical rotation. So, you know, not expecting you to confirm that, but like if that's the case, how do you like manage a minor league rotation in high A? Like if You know what I mean? If it's if everybody else kind of stays in rotation and he goes every week, essentially. Well, I mean, that's that's kind of the thing about this roster is that there's not. There's, I think, a a little there are more dynamic pitchers on this roster, guys who can carry the load of a starter a little more regularly and, and respond well to kind of that oblong strategy that they have for Schultz if and again I don't I don't know if that's true or not at this point but if that's the case um, they definitely they definitely have the uh, the the manpower to to supplement that so um, yeah I mean you know talking to just, I mean not to uh, derail too far from Schultz because you know he kind of is the the star of the show coming into this year but you know, I'm looking at just other natural starters on here I mean we got Juan Carrela uh, in that trade with the uh, with the Yankees last year, uh, Riley Gowans, who knows what, what he's going to be capable of as a starter, Tanner, Tanner McDougal, Peyton Paulette, um, we got Tyler Schweitzer, even Jonas Scalaro made a few starts last year, so there, there there's a certain dynamic nature to the pitching staff this year that's going to see guys who can both start and help out in the bullpen. Yeah, I kind of wanted to get into into the rest of the staff here. Um, you know, and you answered the question about Gowans. I mean, because we don't really know what the plan on him is. Um, we talked a little bit about this before we hopped on, um, that he did have half starts and half relief appearances. So, is I mean, it's, you know, last year um, Noah had Mason Adams piggybacking on him in Kannapolis. And I kind of had the thought that maybe that might possibly be a role that he would fill, knowing that he can go a little bit longer. But, you know, 
again, you know, it's just kind of thinking out loud here. I don't, I don't know exactly what, you know, what the role would be. Well, it's conditional. I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be day to day, week to week, just depending on how this uh, the more rigid strategies for um, those top guys like Noah Schultz kind of pan out. So, um, li- like any minor league season, there there are going to be um, you know unforeseen things that that pop up, and the the key to any good baseball player, any good baseball team is is how you respond and. Um, I, I think that the White Sox have been good at least the the, the three years I've spent so far um, behind the mic. Um, they, they've they've done a good job of that, um, making sure that they're open to moving guys to a different role. Um, also, just a just a random thought here. Uh, I mean, we also have uh, Paulette and McDougal who are both, you know, last year had their year coming back from TJ. So, you know, it's a good thing. I mean, when you look at the roster here and just the sheer amount of names that are on the pitching staff, um, to me, it seems like a, a, a good idea because we, you know, who knows how many innings you can really expect out of those two. And you already know that Noah Schultz is probably going to be on not necessarily a innings limit per se you know but uh you could probably expect a little bit less than you would uh you know it's not gonna be six seven innings out of him you know no but i mean i i wouldn't be surprised if later on in the season it it does get to six seven innings you know um but again just with the nature of any minor league roster and typical plan i mean they're not they're not looking for guys to eat innings in the minors i mean they do have those set kind of plans for them and um that's that's up to the powers that be so um but but again i mean we we have guys who we have guys who have a track record of of going long i, I mean juan Carrela is certainly a, a guy who to me profiles as a uh, a guy who can who can really go the distance um peyton paulette i mean injury you know the injury last year injury troubles last year kind of holding him back from logging as many innings as I think um you know as I know he wanted to uh, he wanted to play for the full season um but you know for for guys like for guys like Peyton uh this this is going to be again I mean this will be his first real you know full season of baseball god willing he stays healthy um and his numbers I mean I was I was looking at him earlier because uh, I'm horrible at memorizing numbers. <laughs> um, you know, record aside, I mean, his, his numbers weren't bad. I mean, he struck out 78 guys in 72 innings. Um, I, he, I was talking to him a little bit earlier today. I mean, he seems ready to go. All these guys are ready to go. There's not a whole lot holding anybody back. And, you know, you can, you can pick apart certain things, like for a guy like Paulette, right? Oh, you know, his fastball – used to touch 99 and he's having trouble getting it back of course he is of course he is that's that's the nature of recovering from an injury so um i'll be interested to see um how a guy like paulette kind of builds back this is a build back year for for him so um so yeah yeah i will say like that's like paulette and mcdougall both were like as ian mentioned were back from tommy john last year but the one paulette had 72 innings um McDougal was right around 72, 70 as well, I believe. So I would think those guys are, you know, not that they're going six innings every time, but you're no. looking at an increase there. I mean, those guys are probably well over a hundred where there's really not that many restrictions. So, you know, I think the only restricted guy would be Schultz. And if they're doing what I expect them to, I mean, those are five or six inning starts too, I think. So, you know, but there is a lot of cover, like we talked about with guys in this bullpen, like not necessarily prospects, but guys like, Cole uh, Densing and Garrett, how do you say, Sean, Sean Lee? Shane Lee. Shane, Shane Lee? Lee? Yeah. So, you know, like th- those guys can rack up innings as well. And then the the minor league rule five guy, Ian, uh, Jose Ramirez, he made 20 starts for the Red Sox last yeah. year. So I don't know if, look, maybe they think that's a relief convert and the stuff's going to play up or whatever, but he's got starts too. Yeah. Yeah, so I that- mean, there's there's lots of innings there you know, in those mm-hmm. arms, it's just, uh, how, how they're going to plan on, you know, divvying yeah. up those innings. I don't think there'll be any shortage of arms. That's for sure. 
Andrew, do you have any expectation of like a traditional closer? Like I know Eric Adler's like our highest rated prospecty type guy, you know, but that doesn't mean that he's getting the ninth every day. I mean, that's definitely the first name that popped into my head was Eric Adler. Uh, I mean, he's he's got kind of the the makeup and track record of a closer he was a guy who last year when the game was really close or on the line we really needed somebody um uh to to um to to take the mound and, and get the job done adler comes out and i would i would take a you know a breath i'd be like all right we're the the, the dasher in good hands here um It'll, it'll be just fine. And he's he's good in high-pressure situations, too, like runners in scoring position. I know a couple of times he was able to just kind of um, shed any fear he might have had about runners on second or third and, and just focus on getting the guy out at the plate. Um, and he's got it. I mean, the fastball is great. Secondary stuff is, I mean, not mind-blowing, but it's, it's there. It's good. So, um, yeah, Adler, for sure, in my mind, is, is the um, – as, as close to a – to a, a tried and true closer as I think we have on this roster. Um, you want to move on to the uh, position players here, James? Yeah, I think so. So that's what I was going to, I mean, look, one of the guys you got coming to you is a little bit of a lightning rod for fans a little bit last year. Just look, the season that Jacob Gonzalez had in his draft season wasn't great. Um, I think me and Ian kind of, you know, try to, I don't know. I don't really take, the draft year of college guys specifically very seriously. So he, he struggled some, but there were good reports um, in instructs. What are you uh, expecting out of Jacob Gonzalez? I can't wait to check in with you as the season moves along to see how he's doing. Well, Jacob Gonzalez. Uh, I mean, the first thing that stands out about him is, is his track record at, at Ole Miss, you know, uh, those are, those are not, those are not numbers that are easy to come by. His career, what is it, 319 hitter, 435 on base, 564 slugging with 40 home runs, 158 runs batted in. He's a bat. He's a bat through and through. And I know he's got a bit of a, a, a bit of a, um, an unorthodox kind of stance and swing, um, but it works for him. And, um, I, I again, I know that his numbers um, – last year with um, Kannapolis were not great. I chalked that up to a couple of things. One, kind of getting adjusted to the everyday, the playing everyday kind of grind that comes with that transition from college to pro ball. Um, the other thing, too, that I might chalk it up to is, is perhaps a more advanced level of pitching. Um, it, you know, could it could have been the yips as well. I'm not really sure, but I don't like to dwell on that because again, it wasn't a full season, and I mean, what it was only 30 games, so small sample size there. Um, I I really, I I dwell on what he was able to do as a good team guy at Ole Miss, and uh, and 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 really kind of use what's different about him to his advantage. Um, I saw him take a couple of swings in, in batting practice today. Um, but, you know, I, I'll, I'll be interested to see how he starts out as, as, an, as an everyday player. I think there's a big question mark above his head, though, as to where he's going to end up defensively. And I was initially a little um, kind of confused at, at uh, you know, why, why the White Sox went with him first. Because, wait, didn't we just – you know, shoot Colson Montgomery through the rankings and you got to young keep in the shortstop spot warm at the, the big league level. Um, so I was like, all right, that's interesting. Um, and automatically I, I thought maybe, maybe there's some versatility there. Maybe they see some versatility in him that um, that'll serve them well long-term as to where that position is. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I would, I would assume he starts at, shortstop opening day and continues there for a while I know he's not the, the quickest guy um, the fielding aspect is there the throwing aspect is there but I, I think it's just gonna it's it's gonna take a month or two to to really get a clearer picture of where he ends up in the field long term but other than that I I, I think I think all the intangibles of a I mean above average hitter are there and I, I think that if the White Sox play their cards right, 
uh, in developing him, I, I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay off for them long term. And I think he's going to be um, – I, I think he's going to contribute. He's going to be an impact guy at the major league level someday. I think the experience level for him, you know, between Team USA and Ole Miss and winning the College World Series is obviously a, a huge, you know, check for him, you know, as far as draft status goes. And I, I know, you know, me and James have both seen uh, a video of him and a retooled swing from his time at Kannapolis last year. Um, so, you know, I also need to, you know, I want to see with my eyes what you know very very small sample size of like three swings that i've seen a video of but the swing looks completely different so i'm interested to see what that translates to and also with a level bump the competition's going to go up so you know i kind of felt i kind of felt a little bit weird about it last year because you know low a usually the the top college guys come through low a and they you know have like a, a pretty it, you know, a pretty decent showing at least. And it, you know, like the passes on the ball in low a were just uh, a little light for me. So I'm really hoping to see a, uh, you know, an uptick in uh, at least projectability in his swing in Winston-Salem. We'll see. Well, from the, the swing alone, I mean, I, from the few uh, hacks I saw on take today, it was pretty clear that he had retooled, his his swing i mean it just in watching video from his days at ole miss i mean he was definitely more hunched in kind of kind of crowding the plate a little bit and he's he seemed to have backed off but his his bat path is still very level and he's able he's able to um still kind of reach for you know outside pitches and he even snags some low and inside so um he's, he's got a good feel for the zone and he i think he's um i mean his, his plate discipline is is probably uh pretty good i mean again i, I won't have um I won't have a better gauge of that until I see him play, you know, m- almost every day. But I'm I'm very optimistic about him. I think he has all the intangibles um, that he needs, and and I think the White Sox should do a good job of of developing him into an impact player. So the other guy that uh, at the atop the prospect prospect list that's coming to uh, Winston this year, uh, part of the return for Dylan Cease, we've got Samuel Zavala. Um, have you been able to see him out on the field yet at all? Yeah, yeah. I actually uh, I, I talked to him um, uh, yesterday for uh, a little bit. Just you know, general, how, how you feeling? How, how you doing? They got a job to do. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have. Uh, you know, I'm not having 15 minute conversations with these guys while they're in, in the cage. But um, he, he seems full of energy. He seems like he's ready. He seems like um, you know the the transition from one system to um, another really didn't phase him just uh you know he's he seems like he's gonna play his same game just in a um in a different uniform in a different uh in a different system so yeah real explosive bat just from the the swings at bp today i mean you got that real high inward leg kick where he just harnesses all that power and then the bat speed um is magnificent Uh, i think uh 80 grade if not close to it but i something tells me that maybe sometimes um that bat speed can kind of control him a little more than he controls it um and i i don't i don't know i mean again limited sample size and uh you know i haven't gotten a feel for how good uh jim rickon is at 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 throwing bp but uh but at at the same time i mean there's there's a reason that he fit comfortably into the Sox top 30 um, as soon as as he was acquired in the trade. So again, another guy um, who I think is going to just play explosive, and I'm I'm really excited about. And I would imagine he's he's likely the primary center fielder. Th- this is like a roster with some guys with some versatility. Who who do you expect to see like next to him, like in the outfield corners? I know DJ Gladney's on this team, but the other spot I wasn't really totally sure about. Well, Chris Lanzilli, um, Chris Lanzilli spent some time with us. Uh, he was up, I think, I think he broke camp with us last year and then was sent down to Kannapolis for like the middle third of the season. And then as some more guys moved up to um, Birmingham, he he came in and, and filled the role of um, 
an almost every day corner outfielder. So, um, yeah, Lanzilli's a, I mean, he's, he's a decent enough defender. Um, you, you know, I, I don't think I've seen him in too many situations where he's had to make I mean, super impressive grabs. Um, but Lanzilli is, uh, Lanzilli, if he can find some more consistency with the bat, is going to be a force at the plate. He's just a, a dense human being, <laughs> and he's got a lot of raw power. Um, so that that's where I see Lanzilli contributing the most. But we've only got three outfielders on this roster. It's it's Gladney and Lanzilli in, the, in either of the corners, and then Zavala will be um, the, the everyday center fielder. As to how that might change, I'm, I'm not sure. But those are the three that the Dash have right now. Yeah, because there are some other, you know, there's some guys lit, like, you know, like Wes Kath is obviously second go round at Winston. I would imagine he's going to be at third most likely, and then there are a couple other infielders, obviously as well. Are you, uh, are you surprised to get Lloyd Elchapayi back? Or so, um, well, it was it was interesting because um, so Chappelle was. He's, he's here. He's here now. Uh, but Mario Camaletti appeared on uh, the, the roster first, and then uh, he, he wasn't here yesterday. I'm, I'm not sure uh, if there's an injury or not there, um, but I, I, I was hearing that maybe he should be good to go within a matter of, within a matter of weeks. I'm really not sure where Chappelle fits then. And Ian and I were talking before, um, b- before we started, um, the, the, the system for middle infielders is, is kind of, kind of backloaded. Um, but you know, whether it's here, whether it's Birmingham, whether, you know, uh, Ch- Chappelle really has uh, a gift as a defender. He is not afraid to, to lay out for hard hit line drives. He can make, you know, sneaky backhand plays, um, just a real smooth glove. His bat was questionable last year, um, but I, I, I really, I, I, I want to see. I want to see all these guys thrive, but I, I really want um, Chappelle to settle into kind of a more consistent role uh, as to where he fits, you know, within the system. But again, I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, there's there are a lot of backloaded. Um, areas in in the system and, and right now the middle infield just kind of happens to be one of those places um, but no I mean he's he's he was out here yesterday uh, going full speed like <clears throat> um, like he would anywhere else um, so yeah but I mean Camaletti is another guy who's very interesting in that um, you know I, I think he so he's primarily a, a second baseman as well uh, but I think there were a couple of games where they West stuck field. him in in yep. the corner in, in the corner outfield. I think in Bowling Green, uh, the last the last series versus them, he was uh, he was in left field last year, and I I don't I don't remember anything to I mean I don't remember anything negative. Um, I don't remember him looking outstanding, but again, the fact that they have enough confidence to to place him there, uh, yeah, he can get the job done. So there's a lot of defensive versatility on this roster as well, and um, Camaletti very well may be one of those guys. Do you think um, – so, I mean, looking at the, the guys that are here, um, I know uh, I'm pretty sure – I've seen Goosenberg at first, and I definitely see Gladney, obviously, at first because uh-huh. he was a first baseman, and then they put him in the outfield. Um, so who are you thinking gets the, the most uh, time at first base? Most time at first. Um, I, I would say, I would say Sean Goosenberg, probably, um, Bryce Willits was also a guy who mm, saw true. some time at first base last yeah. year. Um, but again, he's, he's another one of those, uh, kind of dynamic infielders, uh, as well. So, but I think Sean Goosenberg, uh, at least, you know, for the first month or two of the season, depending on his, uh, his path this year, we'll, we'll see the most time at, at first base. Could be wrong though. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you just mm-hmm. look at the, like all these, all these guys that are on, on this list here and, you know, like Chapp- Chappelle, uh, he's originally was an outfielder. The White Sox moved him to second base. So, I mean, technically, I guess you could probably stick him out in the outfield if you wanted to, uh, Gladney, they've been playing in the outfield Goosenberg. I think he's played left field before as well and he's a second baseman Jacob Gonzalez shortstop you know has also been 
projected as possibly being a second baseman. Uh, I mean, there's just, and then uh, you got Nakawaki shortstop, Jordan Sprinkle shortstop. I mean, there's just, there's a, a lot of, a lot of movement. There can be a lot of possibilities for uh, Kuros to move things around there. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, that's, that's, it's a good problem to have, you know, um, some of the, some of the best defenses in, in the major leagues are, are composed of guys who you can mix and match with every day. So um, yeah, good problem to have, but um, I mean, again, just a lot of, just a lot of raw talent defensively on this roster that I, I think can sometimes get, um, get overlooked. I think defensive talent is, is one of the things that um, can go unsung. So um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I love the outlook um, and just kind of a, kind of a lot of moving pieces. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> do you want to touch on the, on the catching situation, James, before we move to the, uh, the coaching staff? Well, so, I mean, two catchers listed right now. I mean, my, you know, I was assuming last year's fourth round pick out of Ole Miss, Calvin Harris would be in Winston. Uh, we had kind of heard he's rehabbing an injury in Arizona. I don't know how bad it is. So you guys just have the, uh, the two catchers for now on the roster, it seems. Yeah, uh, Weston Eberly um, out of uh, Columbia, and then Colby Smelly, who was with us for I think uh, a majority of last year, if not all of last year, um, out of out of Shelton State Community College um, in, in good old Tuscaloosa. I was talking with Colby um, earlier, just just about uh, the pitching staff, and um, you know, I mean, the the catching situation has uh, it's it's been not the forefront of the discussion as it pertains to the, the, the farm system, but there've been a lot of big names. I mean, with Hackenberg and with Michael Turner, I mean, certainly Turner, I, I can't believe that he spent as much time in high A as, as he did last year. He is so talented and he's honestly a, a, a better bat um, for a catcher than, than I've seen. Um, but yeah, I, I think catchers this year aren't, going to be the focus I think the focus is is pitching primarily um with with you know um Schultz kind of being the face of that I mean again not to derail too far from from catching but I mean there's there's just um you know I mean neither of these guys show up on on the top 30 uh no discredit to them I mean they're you know they're fine ball players they're pros um you know uh but I think it's I think it's more about pitching and uh, and and continuing to develop uh, you know good um, position players, uh, but yeah, I, I really don't have a whole lot to to talk about catching wise besides the fact that uh, I'm glad to see guys who played here the past three years move up and and earn the promotions that that they deserve and who's to say that that Eberly or Smelly won't uh, won't pop off the same way this year I mean they're both talented guys in their own right and um, that's kind of the beauty of, of minor league baseball is that with a new season you never know who's gonna start to start to blip as a little spot on somebody's radar so you guys do have a uh, entirely new coaching staff in Winston-Salem what are your uh, your takeaways so far well, not an entirely new coaching staff. I mean, Guillermo Quiroz is yeah. back as our manager, but he's got a new uh, staff below him. John Kovalik uh, is the pitching coach, and he comes from the Astros system. He had been there since 2018. No affiliated professional experience, but he did uh, pitch for three years in the American Association after being a pretty solid reliever at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania. Um, that's that's uh, funny enough where our president, GM, um, graduated from uh, from college, so um, it's funny how those things kind of intersect. But nevertheless, um, the guys seem to have a good rapport with him already. Just during live ABs today, um, I was uh, you know I was pleasantly surprised to um, see him interact well and uh, just kind of you know joke around, but also uh, get the job done that he needs to in uh, monitoring these guys with the um, you know with the rap soto and everything. Um, but yeah, I mean. Uh, clearly experienced though as a pitching coach in affiliated ball um, helped the Astros a good bit since 2018 um, so excited to see kind of how he continues to build that rapport with the guys here in Winston um, and then Jim Rickon is we uh, Ian and I were talking uh, James before you hopped on about how that's kind of a, a pivot from at least the um, as the dash are concerned um, just the experience level of hitting coaches, yeah, at least since I've 
uh, been here in 2021. So that year it was Mike Daniel. Um, and then the year after it was Nikki Delmonico, first year as a coach. Um, and then last year was Jason Krizan, also first year as a coach. Um, but Jim Rickon brings over 25 years of experience as both the player and, um, you know, as a coach, as a hitting coordinator, uh, you know, he's that's that's not uh, something that's that's easily obtained. That's a lot of time, effort and energy put into, you know, uh, the, the field of player development. And I think it's a good sign of what what the White Sox want their guys at the lower levels of the minor leagues to to um or who rather to, to look up to and, and to, to garner advice and, and tips from. Um, so kind of a, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how he works with the guys as well, but he's, he's, he's a great guy, good, loose personality, just like the last three have been. I was chopping it up uh, with them yesterday about like Metallica and stuff, which is pretty cool. So, um, and then Darius day is, uh, is no stranger to the white Sox either. He had, uh, he spent, um, a uh, good few years as uh, I think a coordinator for the ACE program. So he gets to interact with um, DJ Gladney um, day in, day out now, a guy who I'm, I'm sure he um, interacted with quite a bit when coordinating the ACE program. Um, so, yeah, and then A.J. Smith moves up a rank from Kannapolis as the athletic trainer. Carson Wooten, after spending three years here, has moved up as well. Um, Zach Poston is his uh, assistant athletic trainer. And then Logan Jones uh, returns for his second year as performance coach. Great guy. Logan is, um, I think he's, he's a North Carolina native, and he played at Guilford College, which is in Greensboro. So he knows the area well, um, and, and he, uh, he's putting these guys on the right track in the weight room and with uh, nutrition plans. And then uh, new clubhouse manager, too, Chance Miller. Um, Chance Miller uh, had a chance to talk with him yesterday. He's ready to go, uh, getting everything set equipment-wise and taking good care of the, the clubhouse that we're, uh, we're doing a lot of renovations on here at the stadium. So being able to work around that uh, has to be a challenge in and of itself, let alone getting to know all these guys and having all your ducks in a row with snacks and drinks and just keeping everything neat and tidy. I always like to give the clubhouse manager a shout out as well. So great field staff, a lot of experience. Uh, there's there's a there's just a different energy about this coaching staff this year and how they gel with the players. And it's just a uh, it's it's a real family unit this year. And I'm enjoying kind of the the beginnings of it as I do every year. Um, I think this is a good group, and I think it's going to be a really good season. Do you think there's anything significant about having an actual bench coach the white Sox haven't for a while i know once chris gets became gm i don't know the reason for it all the affiliates now have bench coaches any it just you know any significance uh behind that well last year's bench coach was um and i, I don't think he he wasn't officially listed as bench coach i mean he was just kind of an assistant coach kind of a rover um doing whatever was needed on a particular day and i would assume that darius day's responsibilities will be pretty similar but Milwee, you know Milwee, and I, I think Darius kind of fits this too like you know younger kind of morale boosting presence that can relate to um the guys on on a level that um you know that that um just comes with being around the same age um at least that's what I saw with with Milwee last year I mean um I, I like to compare Milwee actually to like uh Think of like a like a defensive backs coach on like a like an NCAA football team. You know, like just always high energy, like you know the backwards visor wearing type kind of hype man. Um, so that that is really kind of a that's that's a responsibility that you don't find, I would imagine, in the in the job description for something like that. Uh, I think, but as as to you know the his specific. Uh, roles and responsibilities. I mean, I, I haven't gotten a chance to talk to him um, much about what that looks like, but given what uh, Daniel Milwee did last year um, and did very well, I would assume it would look very similar. Yeah, I mean, Milwee just came off of a opening day roster himself, <laughs> not too short, not too uh, yeah. short of a period ago. So, and Milwee's in Kannapolis this year, so they the the White Sox clearly love him and um, want him to continue. Uh, you know, serving these uh, these young guys as they come through the minors. Uh, do you have anything else uh, player-wise, James? 
All right. Well, uh, Andrew, I've got a question for you okay. uh, because I know that you're a music guy. Um, I just had a uh, a thought. I, I wanted to know uh, what's a what's your favorite concert that you've been to in the last couple of years here. Oh man. Um, well, <laughs> so last September, right after the season ended, my girlfriend surprised me with um, tickets to Widespread Panic in Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm a big jam band guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love like the Grateful Dead. I love Fish. Um, Goose is another one that's come out uh, lately that I really like. But I'm I'm a big musical instrument guy, and I I play guitar. I've played drums. I've played piano. I've played bass guitar. Um, it just fascinates me, and I really dig the concept of musical improvisation. I think that's like that's the to me the greatest test of someone's real skill set as a musician is can you can you jump in and just play along with the groove and make it up as you go so yeah widespread panic at wilmington was was very very cool um but trying to think i mean other concerts i don't get to too many concerts anymore just because of the rugged schedule that that baseball brings and i I wouldn't trade it for the world um but um Tedeschi Trucks Band is another uh, a solid group that I, I think more people should know about. I saw them last March in Asheville, and uh, Derek Trucks, I think, is one of the greatest guitarists of all time. I think he is going to go down in the history books with the likes of Hendrix, Clapton. Uh, he's He's really got something special, and he spent his entire life basically around you know, the influences of, uh, of, of Greg Allman and, and his uncle, who was the, the drummer of the Allman Brothers Band, one of the two drummers. Um, but, yeah, I, I really admire and respect his playing and his wife, Susan. Oh, my God, she's got a voice like an angel. She's fantastic. So, um, But I, I, I could go on about, about music for, for days, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't want this to turn into a jam band podcast. That's fair. <laughs> All right. So uh, I know I've, I've watched the, the couple of episodes of the Dashcast. Uh, do you want to go ahead and promote anything on your, on your way out? Yeah, you know, um, we have a lot to promote this year. I mean, it seems like we have a theme night or a promo night um, just about every game this season. We just released um, the Winston-Salem Hype Hens, which is a play on hyphens from last year. Um, so we got really creative with that. Uh, merchandise is available for that as well as the Winston-Salem Tobacco Beetles, which will be our salute to, uh, our salute to North Carolina, really. Uh, and then we are releasing one more alternate identity coming up here very soon. And that is a salute to Chicago. So White mm-hmm. Sox fans, pretty much everybody in Chicago land are going to want to tune in for that. Cause that, that, the one that we haven't released is my favorite. So, um, yeah, and, you know, this year we're just – we're really balling out with the uh, the different theme nights. I mean, we've got a Taylor Swift night. We've got our Wake Forest night. We've got our Winston-Salem State night, golf night, education day, super splash day. The list goes on and on. And we've actually added some new features to the ballpark as well. Um, a big one is the new batting cage – or well, there are two batting cages now in um, – uh, basically the same area where, where the old one was looking out over the highway. But um, we were now uh, compliant in that way with the, uh, the PDL standards, and that's going to double actually as an event space too, so folks will be able to book um, events. I think that space can hold up to 200 people. It's massive. It looks pretty awesome. Yeah, and then we just renovated our uh, visiting clubhouse, put a new training room in there. Um, I think some upgrades to the home clubhouse might be on the way. Um, either I, I'm not really sure the time frame on that. But fan-facing things this year, the big one is the Lost Worlds Brewing uh, Bar out in left field. That is going to uh, that's going to be kind of a um, – you know, an, an open kind of social area where folks can kick back and enjoy the game, much like the Wicked Weed Brew Pen or the Foothills Brewing Flight Deck. So, um, yeah, lots lots to look forward to at the ballpark this year. And I'm just I'm looking at this field right now and I'm just like I'm 
I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it to, to start, and things are looking really, really good around Winston-Salem, and I, I just uh, I, I want to thank you guys, really, for, for making, uh, making us look good here in the broadcast booth and clipping all those highlights and all the work that you guys do, um, not, not only to make, uh, make us in Winston-Salem look good, but to, uh, to, to serve the, the tried-and-true White Sox fans who I know are really active and, and engaged on Twitter and Instagram and just about everywhere else, so um yeah thanks a lot for all you guys do and and we're looking forward to a uh to another really good season here in winston appreciate your time thank you very much um so if you are listening to this in uh, podcast form know that you can also watch it on our youtube channel um you can also find it anywhere that you find your podcast if you are watching it on YouTube. Uh, futuresocks.net, you can find all of our written content. You will find a affiliate uh, preview with uh, for, the, for the Dash and every other affiliate for the White Sox on futuresocks.net. You can find uh, a link to Patreon to support us there. Um, my name is Ian Eskridge at Daily White Sox. He is James Fox at JamesFox917. Andrew Murphy, A.W. Murphy 50. We appreciate your time so much. Have a great day, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks.